no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. We are going to cover a few new developments that everyone might not have heard. First, Elon Musk has stated that three of the Raptor engines on the orbital Starship were shut down on startup for being outside of acceptable parameters. This would be done to prevent a possible engine explosion. It concerns me a little that this many engines failed to operate properly, but since this was the first test flight, I'm not too worried. Several people have commented that the Saturn V F-1 and the Space Shuttle main engines have never failed in flight, and this is true. But SpaceX is not trying to build the rocket equivalent of a Bugatti, costing tens of billions of dollars each and flying once per year. Just one Space Shuttle main engine costs over $140 million. This would not be practical for the rocket equivalent of a heavy-duty truck. These same people are quick to criticize that one of the Raptor 2 engines blew up, taking out several others around it, and creating a massive asymmetrical thrust. But they miss the fact that despite three engines out on launch and an explosion destroying several others, the rocket did not fall to the earth and explode like the N1. It did, in fact, continue to fly. Despite the fact that it had lost hydraulic power, as an explosion had taken out the hydraulic pressure unit here. What you didn't see was a massive explosion destroying the entire ship. And SpaceX is working hard on the Raptor 3, which was recently able to withstand 350 bar pressure during a test fire, producing 269 tons of force, as they like to say, which would be about 2,700 kilonewtons, or 2.7 meganewtons. Far exceeding the Raptor 2's record-setting 300 bar pressure and 2.5 meganewtons of force. I spoke about the potential for a 3.5 meganewton raptor in this video, and some people made fun of me, saying that no one was even talking about such a thing. I'm very happy to see that those people were wrong. I am sometimes critical of the space shuttle, and with good reason. For instance, on STS-93, the space shuttle Columbia launched into orbit with a mass for the orbiter and payload of 122,534 kilograms but the space shuttle returned to Earth with a mass of 99,781 kilograms, leaving only 22,753 kilograms in orbit, making the shuttle a suboptimal payload delivery system, easily matched or beaten by rockets of its time, like the Delta Heavy, with a capacity of over 28 metric tons to low Earth orbit, the Titan IV at about 24 metric tons, and the Proton-M, which could carry 23 metric tons. Today, the SpaceX Falcon Heavy can get three times as much to low Earth orbit. Some will say that this is not a fair comparison, as the space shuttle also carried crew, allowing up to eight astronauts to go to the ISS at a time. But this vehicle was not optimized for crew safety. During the first two minutes of flight, if something went wrong, there was no viable abort option. This meant that from launch to solid rocket booster separation, nothing could be done to effectively save the crew. The SpaceX Dragon capsule, carrying up to seven astronauts and flying on a Falcon 9 rocket, is much safer than the space shuttle could ever be. It can also be pointed out that the Starship is planned to carry payload and crew, and that's a valid point. But with the payload capacity at least seven times that of the space shuttle, there is no real comparison. And the Starship is a conventional rocket configuration capable of an in-flight abort at almost any point in its flight. Once they get the Starship start up and release procedures worked out. I personally think that the nose cone of Starship should be capable of release and independent operation with emergency rocket engines, perhaps Super Dracos, around the perimeter. And if the bottom were a dome, we would create a massive aerospike effect, like Stokes Space's building creating a very efficient escape and landing system. All the crew would be here at launch and could blast themselves away from a failing booster or starship. A stage two plus, if you like. I also think this configuration is a lot smarter for moon landings, as it makes no sense to bring down the empty mass of these giant tanks, leaving this part in orbit 
and land with this only. I think it would work a lot better. You would only need about 2,000 meters per second of delta V to safely land on the moon once you were in lunar orbit. If we set our initial mass to 1.0 and run through our rocket equation, solving for final mass, we see that with a needed delta V of 2,000 meters per second and a specific impulse of, say, 325 seconds, multiplying by 9.81 to get our exhaust velocity of 3,188 meters per second, and using 2.7183 for the constant E, we see that we will land with over 53% of our lunar orbit mass. If we wanted to have 100 metric tons on the surface of the moon, we would need to start in lunar orbit with a little more than 187 metric tons. Getting back off the surface to lunar orbit is the same, 2,000 meters per second. So lifting off with 100 metric tons will get us back into orbit with over 53 metric tons. We would of course be leaving a lot of equipment and other materials on the moon, so there would be a nice safety margin. Once in orbit, the landing stage could redock with the Starship and head back home. And finally, Scott Manley noticed this. Here we see the Starship spinning out of control. And here we see the Starship FTS activated. And then here we see the booster flight termination system activated, blasting holes in the top of the booster. But the rocket does not explode. Instead, it continues to flip end over end, until finally tearing apart at the base and exploding. I had said that the test of the FTS system was a success, but I have to reevaluate that. The FTS system Starship used is fairly standard in the industry, and has worked well on other rockets, but the Starship is pretty tough, and the lengthy delay between activation of the FTS and destruction of the rocket is certainly a problem. This would have been a perfect time for a Starship abort or for a nose cone aboard, if the starship could not be saved. In any event, Scott Manley noticed these gases streaming for a long time, over 40 seconds before the booster finally exploded. And the explosion seemed to come from the bottom up. I think there needs to be a flight termination charge down here anyway, as blowing apart the propellant tank and engine downcomer junction should cause the fastest explosion possible maybe with a detonation cord along the side of the booster tanks, to unzip the steel. That should make for a much faster and bigger explosion. Just as this new flight termination system was activated, the Starship could uncouple and try to save itself. If this failed, the nose cone could then release and try to land itself safely, with all the crew and passengers on board. This would give a double fail safety margin, a nice option to have when you are carrying human beings into space. Just a few things to think about and catch up on. Stay safe and thanks for listening. At Astro Proterra.